Hello and welcome to The Office Field Guide. My name's Chris and I'm reviewing every episode of The Office ever. Today we are looking at the 18th episode of the third season of The Office entitled The Negotiation. This one was written by one of my favorites, Michael Schur, and was directed by Jeffrey Blitz, who we talked about last during the Convict episode. The negotiation aired on April 5th, 2007, and was viewed by 6.7 million people. And I'll call out that this episode did get Schur nominated for a Primetime Emmy, but he lost to Greg Daniels for The Gay Witch Hunt. And as for that dip in ratings, I have no idea why it happened. So if you know, leave it in the comments. It is the lowest viewed episode of season three. Your trivia for today is, what is Ryan Howard's middle name? It was mentioned in this episode, so be the first to put it in the comments and you'll get your name in next week's video. So as always, keep an eye out for the Easter egg, Prison Mike, or Floating Andy hidden somewhere in this episode. Be the first to put the timestamp in the comments and you can get your name in next week's video. Here's last week's winners, congrats. And with that, let's get these talks started. Negotiation is an art, back and forth, give and take. No one uh, asked you anything ever? This episode is similar to an explosion. The burst happens in the first minute of airtime. Here we go. And we're gonna go to dinner. Okay. And then we're gonna go to the movie. Sounds good. Hey, helper! And the rest of this episode is just picking up the pieces. And there are a lot of pieces. We've got Michael and Daryl's negotiation, the love triangle dealing with this event, Angela getting hot and bothered every time someone tells the story of Dwight's heroism, and Jim trying to pay Dwight back. So with so much going on, I'm gonna try to organize the chaos. If I miss some of your favorite stuff, tell me how awful I am in the comments. So let's go. I'm gonna kick us off with a quick round of callbacks because this is one of Michael Schur's favorite things. First, when Michael's discussing the outcomes of the day, he mentions win, win, win. Both Daryl and I took something. Higher salaries, win, win, win. This is a callback to conflict resolution. And number five is win, win, win. The important difference here is with win, 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 we all win. Me too. Michael needs to role play with Jim. Okay, I want you to be Daryl and ask me for a raise because I need to try out some of these negotiation tactics on you. Just like in the Halloween episode. I'm sorry? I want you to role play firing me. I want you to fire me and I will take it. There's a callback to Daryl teaching Michael sling. You know, stuff like fleece it out, going Mach 5, dink and flicker. Yeah, I taught Mike some new phrases. I want him to get the raise. Just can't help myself. Roy calls Pam, Pammy. I'm so sorry, Pammy. And don't call me Pammy. Kevin's saying he's got Jim's back. Jim, it, Roy, look out. Just like in Boys and Girls. I bet he'll try to beat you up. Thanks for the heads up, Kev. I got your back if he does. We also get this great callback to Dwight's possible belief that superheroes exist. And change into capes and fly around fighting crime. Those are the real heroes. Okay, um, you're thinking of a superhero. We all have a hero in our heart. I also think it's strange that heroes exist in the office's universe. Do you know who's a real hero? Hero from Heroes. That's a hero. When we know that Jack Coleman and Sindel Rama Murthy both make appearances in The Office in later seasons. And you know who else played in Heroes? Nicholas D'Agusto, who plays Hunter and has his very first appearance in The Negotiation. And then your assistant was all young and hot and I... Okay, so sorry to come back with the wardrobe change and everything, but I actually already finished this field guide, but then I got in contact with Nicholas D'Agusto and he was willing to discuss his time on The Office. And what makes this really difficult is that we had a really great conversation and it lasted a half an hour, but I only have about three minutes to put into this episode, which means I'm gonna have to butcher the crap out of this interview and leave a lot of good stuff out. I will for sure post a longer interview in the next couple days, so be on the lookout for that. I'm, so, I'm stoked to be here, happy to talk about The Office. So yeah. I guess to kick us off, um, are you a fan of The Office? Yeah, well, I became a fan um, after I was cast, honestly. I, it's not that I wasn't a fan or something. It's just that I wasn't really... I'm usually late to the game on TV shows. Uh, the reason I was on The Office is this guy, Jeff Blitz. Now, do you know the name Jeff Blitz? I do, yeah. He's a oh, director okay. and producer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I only mention it just because uh, 
I, I'm lucky to call that guy a good friend of mine, and I've worked with him a lot over the years. I worked with him on this movie called Rocket Science. And anyway, I created a relationship with Jeff. He brought me into audition, but he gave me the job of Hunter. And uh, so, you know, obviously it was just like a, a real joy to be on the show. And it's, it's no surprise to say that it's an honor to be a part of just this world because here I am, I worked on that show maybe two days and here I am talking to you about it a decade later. But the other thing I wanted to say is that uh, Steve is obviously relentlessly funny. The writers are relentlessly funny. And you're going to maybe know the scene better than I do. But he's like, in, it's one of those moments where he's in the office at the end of the night, at the end of that sequence where I was, where Hunter's there. And he's doing some direct to camera stuff. And they probably gave him 40 options, 40 joke options. And writers just coming in one after another. Joke after joke after joke after joke. And he just like spits them out, does them. And everybody's dying. And you know they're only going to choose one. But one of the, the fun things of that environment was, and one of the reasons that shooting went so incredibly long on that show, was that people just never wanted to stop performing for each other. So you can imagine if you're a fan of The Office that I, I bet you'd like to see 39 outtakes because there are 39 outtakes of basically every one of those bits. The last little anecdote I like to share is... Do you know the moment when Melora Hardin, when Jan drops the box, or the box, the bottom falls out of the box? Right. So that is, uh, was a total accident. And, um, you know, we'd done that take two or three times already. And she just walks out with the box. She hugs me and, you know, she kind of like gets, she shouts what she shouts. But then there was just this one kind of magical mistake moment where, uh, you know, happy accident is what they call it. And the bottom just fell out. The weight of, this, of the trophy inside or whatever the hell it was, the desk, the desk weights just fell out of the box. And I'm just glad that, you know, I wasn't, uh, a big part of that world is just not laughing, uh, you know, and not losing focus. And I'm glad we all, we all just kind of picked it up and Hunter starts helping her with the box, but it was all kind of a wonderful, happy accident. And, uh, you know, it's fun to, whenever I see that scene, I always laugh about, knowing that that was just like a totally random occurrence and it absolutely makes the scene, it makes the button of that scene. Okay, and again, for time, I'm gonna cut it off right there. I can't say enough good things about this guy. You know when you leave someone's presence and they just make you feel better about yourself? That's such a great quality. That's a quality human being there. We hit on a lot more, like his time on other shows. I asked him about that one night and the theory that Hunter is Astrid's father. So be sure to be on the lookout for that longer interview. But for now, let's get back to our regularly scheduled field guide. Bono admiration is invoked here. That's a hero. Also Bono. And in the pilot. Heroes of mine would be Bob Hope, Bono. And it's not really a callback, but a good segue is the return of Andy Bernard. I graduated from anger management the same way I graduated from Cornell, on time. Nobody up to this point really knew what was happening with the character of Andy. I wasn't sure if Ed Helms was even gonna come back to the show, but it was announced about a month before the episode aired that Ed Helms was returning for the remainder of this year. And he never leaves. Guess who's back? <laughs> and the surface joke of this entire episode is Michael attempting all these power plays with Daryl. Negotiations are all about controlling things, about being in the driver's seat. And you make one tiny mistake, you're dead. And yet, the power keeps getting swept out from underneath him. Michael's wearing a woman's suit, which is less commentary on powerful women and more commentary on Michael's stupidity. Michael's paycheck is exposed, immediately placing he and Daryl on the same level. They're not gonna give the working man more than the boss. Well, what am I supposed to do? Get your own raise. And Michael even sits in the middle seat in the truck, which maybe I'm reading too much into this, is probably the least desirable place to sit in a truck like this. And there's a lot of background humor in this episode as well, something I've noticed Sure loves. My favorite example of this is Kelly's phone call in the background. Okay, let me just get the folder out. Okay, it seems here that you ordered 12,000 reams of paper. Oh, 12 reams. And the last thing I wanted to comment on was since there was a three month break between Roy saying this. I'm gonna kill Jim Halpern. And then doing this. Right! Right! Go!
meaning that there was a lot of buildup and suspense in those months. This was a water cooler cliffhanger. People would have spent months chit-chatting with their coworkers and friends and family about what was going to happen. Binging this on Netflix just doesn't give you the same sense, as it all happens so fast. Either way, I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments about this whole situation. But with that, let's get to the deeper meaning. Why don't you explain this to me like I'm five? Okay, and the title really helps us figure out this one. A negotiation is a continual power struggle between two parties to get the best deal possible. But they can range from anything as bartering for something at a garage sale, buying a car, salary negotiations, and up from there. The act tends to have three phases with the initiation, the exchanges, and the conclusion slash resolution. Pippity poppy, give me the zabit. Yes, sir. Remember that. The writers crafted this episode with the negotiation device in the main plotline. We get to see Michael, Jan, and Daryl handle real power struggles, and it's a character study of its own. Because that is the way these things are done in films. But the subplots are equally a character study depicting the power dynamics as they're shifted around. Why don't you just take that pen and stab me in the heart? Michael is stupid in this episode. Like, really dumb. Right. No, but we can offer you 12. But you just said 15. Wikipedia is the best thing ever. Anyone in the world can write anything they want about any subject. So you know you are getting the best possible information. Apparently hundreds or thousands of Office fans took to Wikipedia after this episode to make nonsensical statements about negotiations, to the point that Wikipedia actually soft locked those pages down until the attention faded. But I think there's something to the fact that everyone has their own way of handling these power shifts in life. Michael, knowing that he doesn't know what he's doing, leans on the collective understanding of society as a whole to give his negotiation the best shot. If he did intend that, wow. Genius. Daryl, either intentionally or unintentionally, keys in on Michael's insecurity to deconstruct his position of power. Okay, okay. can you stay right there for one second? I gotta send some emails. Jane uses corporate speak and HR approved language and negotiation techniques to maintain power. Right now we can offer you a 6% raise. 6%? But then opts to help Michael out of their shared interest in each other. I just need you to ask for it so I can record that you asked for it. Dwight only stands behind his principles and everything he does. You don't know what it is. Don't want it, won't open it. Don't need it, won't take it. Citizens do not accept prizes for being citizens. Jim, similar to Michael, relies on others. <laughs> but Jim has little interest in appearing powerful in general. We'll never say a word. And now we are even. And Pam is trying to change her style up from someone who's passive to someone who's actively telling the truth. Wait a minute, you broke up our wedding for the guy. No, there were a lot of reasons. And I don't really think that there's a message here. It's just a character study on how these people handle different dynamics in a relationship and in business, which is a great example of an episode that focuses on the American workplace. Or I don't know, maybe this whole episode is to explain how useless Creed really is. So the big fella pulls out a sock filled with nickels. Then Cheroot grabs a can of hairspray and a lighter. You're useless. That's a joke. Don't leave. I was just kidding. With that, let's get to the Dundies. And then I gotta get him to the Dundies. The Dundee for the most ridiculous acting in this episode goes to Steve Carell. I make very compelling argument. You make very compelling argument. And the longest engagement Dundee goes to Roy Anderson. I'm so sorry, Pammy. I wasn't gonna do anything with them. I kept thinking about you two together. I just thought you guys were really good friends, or maybe he was gay or something. I'm sorry, too. I think enough is enough. I think we should set a date for our wedding. On uh, June 10th, 
Come on, let's do it. Wait a minute, you broke up our wedding for the guy. No, there were a lot of reasons. Your friend got engaged. She was always engaged. Roy said the first one didn't count. Now, I've been working out and, um, you know, I'm not going to take her for granted. I got to win her back. Your art was the prettiest art of all the art. This is over. Yeah, you're right. This is so I just, I think that we both made some bad choices. You're not even going to try to go out with him. I don't get you, Pam. I know. Negotiation is an art. Back and forth, give and take. She's got a way about her. gives what what gives you the right okay how do you rate a cold opening like this it's one of the most unique in the series and it's honestly pretty intense but the humor is on point well who's laughing now it's acted really well it's shot well it's wrote well I'll give this one a four out of five and as for the episode let's keep that four out of five on the screen I think this one is hilarious. <laughs> Italians don't wear pockets. It's been a really rough couple of days. This helps a little. It's a beautiful episode that closes the mid-season arcs and brings us to the finish line of season three. I do give this one a four out of five because I think it's a great half an hour of television. But that's just what I think about this episode. What do you think about the negotiation? I want to hear your thoughts in the comments. So thank you so much for watching. Share this content with your friends. Next week, we're going to be looking at... Yeah. Bingo! Whoa, whoa, whoa! Oh. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next week.